Welcome to the Shift Gold Friday Gold Wrap, your weekly overview of precious metals and market updates. I'm your host, J.D. Bauman, and I'm here with my brother, Joel. Thanks for tuning in. Joel, great to see you. Happy Friday. You're alive. Alive and well. Helene didn't get me. Milton barely scratched. We remained with power. All is well, just some sticks and stones, but nothing broke my bones. Can't break your bones, but they'll break your house though. Is your roof okay? Yeah. Uh, everything just literally sticks. And Emily and I were up all night because we kept hearing banging in our house. And I, I like kept going outside in the middle of the storm because I was like, what is banging against the house? I couldn't figure it out. The next morning, the backyard was a graveyard of avocados. Really? And I never put two and two together, but we have an avocado tree in the corner and they were getting flung around like grenades. A lot of them were just like busted open and just smashed against the the house. But honestly, I, I'll take it. Like if that's, if that's the worst I had to deal with, like that's pretty awesome. We were safe and blessed. And honestly, I just wanted to say thank you to, like I got so many texts and emails from clients and individuals mm. who reached out and just kind of were extending their hopes and prayers to Emily and I. So I genuinely thank you. I, I appreciate that. Yeah, that's awesome. And our continued hopes and prayers go out to everyone who's still affected by mm. both Milton and Helene. Yeah. Shall we jump into things? Let's go. Gold this week closed at $2,657 per ounce, up $5 an ounce since this time last week. Silver closed this week at $31.52 per ounce, up $0.67 cents since this time last week. The dollar index is at 102.93, and the VIX, the fear gauge, is up to 20.46. A quick roadmap for this week's episode. We open with key headline updates. We have a price action review. We cover notable consumer credit contraction, the national impact of the recent hurricanes, and an exciting Shift Gold promo coming up next week. Let's dive in. Here are the biggest economic headlines this week. Inflation hotter than expected. September's core CPI data came out at 0.2%. That's above the anticipated 0.1% month on month. Still, the Fed is poised to cut interest rates. On Wednesday, the September FOMC meeting was released. Fed rate cuts are still seen as likely. The CME FedWatch tool shows that over 90% of economists expect a 0.25% cut in November, and still over 84% expect another cut in December. Jobless claims jump. Claims have jumped to their highest level in over a year, rising by 33,000 to 258,000. This increase is attributed to temporary factors such as Hurricane Helene, strikes, and plant shutdowns. Wholesale prices have stalled. There was a slight 0.1% increase in the PPI rate, a survey Friday showed. This signals potential economic slowdown. Consumer sentiment falls. The University of Michigan said Friday that its consumer sentiment survey fell to 689 down from September's revised reading of 70.1. The data was weaker than expected, as economists had anticipated a more modest rise to 70.9. And economic weakness abroad. Global manufacturing continues to decline, dragging down the services sector, as seen in J.P. Morgan's Global Composite Index, dropping to an alarming 52. Chinese stocks plunged on Monday, with the Shanghai Composite dropping 6.6%, marking the steepest decline since 2020 amid growing concerns that the government's stimulus package, driven by special bond issuance, may fall short. Mexico's manufacturing sector hit a 32-week low as the newly released September PMI fell to 47.3 from 48.5 in August. Declining orders, rising costs, and competition weaken production and employment with business confidence at its lowest in over three years. Japan's leading economic indicator was just released, falling to 106.7, the lowest reading since 2020, with Japan's government this week warning the economy is, quote, halting to fall, a term used when signaling an impending contraction. And in geopolitical news, wars and rumors of wars, U.S. officials state that despite recent setbacks and failed attacks on Israel, Iran has not yet decided to pursue building a nuclear weapon. This assessment remains unchanged, even after Israel's elimination of Hezbollah leaders. 
Joel, a ton of news this week. <laughs> what are you seeing for gold and silver? What matters most and where have prices been? Where do you think they're going? Yeah, a lot of exciting news, JD. It seems like every week as we get deeper into October and then a few weeks from now when we're in November, we'll get to elections. It's going to get even more exciting. For gold and silver, price action was kind of tame. Another consolidation week, another high base. Uh, resistance for gold still proving to be around the tie 26s. And for silver, still the 32s being its resistance level. We're not out of the woods of the low 30s. Again, can't wait till we break out and just rip back up to the highs of 50. But in the meantime, we did get that pullback you asked for, JD. So on <laughs> Tuesday, we had a notable drop on gold and silver as the news report came out that the Hezbollah group based in Lebanon wanted to discuss a ceasefire. So a bit of the war premium on gold and silver came off for a bit. But just like we talk about all the time, and we mentioned on the podcast that geopolitics, unless they're extremely major, don't really long-term drive that action for gold and silver. It's more monetary-based. And sure enough, the economic news uh, that we got Thursday and then this morning on Friday with the PPI, that undid any of the sell-off for gold, uh, specifically PPI being hotter than expected, as you mentioned. Um, but the the biggest thing, is, so if gold and silver didn't have exciting action this week, what did have really exciting action was the Europe and Asian markets. We're seeing immense weakness over there with China's stock market crashing on Monday. Biggest loss in years with the Shanghai index down 6.6 and the CSI 300 falling 7% in a single day. And this is on top of the 300 billion special bond issuance. So they're doing QE, they're putting in capital reserves for the bank to keep financial markets solvent as possible. The Chinese government's giving cash injections and they're still seeing tremors over there. This is important because we watch these foreign markets because we know what's happening over there is just a foretaste of what's to come here in the United States. Pretty shocking how it's on a tear downwards despite all the stimulus. If the Chinese economy enters contraction, would that mean that the Bank of China is poised to loosen up monetary policy and reduce its gold reserves and buy less gold? We know in the past, the Chinese central bank has been one of the biggest buyers of gold. Are we going to see less of that in the future? I mean, they're already doing monetary easing, and they're, they're already one of the biggest buyers of gold. As we move systemically more into risk-off territory, I mean, gold is going to continue to increase on balance. Mm. Bringing it back stateside, another recession indicator notable consumer credit contraction and higher interest rates. Americans have slashed their credit card usage with revolving credit balances plunging by $1.35 in August, the biggest drop since 2021. You know, this marks the second decline in just three months, a classic signal of major economic anxiety among individuals. Also, while individual credit usage contracts, credit card interest rates are exploding. We have a blog post on this that listeners can check out. It shows that even as central banks are cutting interest rates and signaling more rate cuts to come, consumer credit card interest rates are hitting all-time highs. Recent bank rate report said that the average retail credit card interest rate, Joel, get this, this is massive. The average interest rate on credit cards hit a whopping 30.45% this year, Oof. up from 2021's average of 14.35%. <laughs> this is pretty shocking. You said 30.45%? 30.45%. You know, if it's making me think, like if we talk a lot about the, like, the double standard and the bifurcation, but as institutions get access to lower and lower capital, at, at, you know, anyone who has access to SOFA or LIBOR, they get immense amount of cash at lower rates. But yet the marginal consumer who maybe they live on credit cards, they're paying higher rates than ever. This is like loan shark territory. And yet it's done by, you know, the Barclays and the the experience of the world. I mean, this is this is really bad, man. It's pretty shocking. Well, okay, I sorry to cut you off, but the you know, Robert Kiyosaki who's a really good friend of Peter um the and also a rich dad poor dad guy, He's, right? Rich dad poor dad. Yeah, he talks about that, you know, they they want to keep you poor, and it's like when you see this stuff, it's like hard to believe that's not the case. You know, it's already so difficult like if you're in if you're in poverty for a long time, you, it's hard to get out of it. It's it's a lot like the obesity stats, like they say if your BMI is above 30 for so many years, it's like the chances of you getting out of it uh, without immense life changes is just almost impossible. Same thing's true for poverty where if you're in stuck in the poverty rut, it's like 
getting out of it is very very hard right um but it's really just, it just it's just anyway it's just yeah it reminds me of this that. concept of just how expensive it is to be poor right like if you don't have a car you have to take the bus sure. and like if you take the bus and it's irregular you're going to be late for work and you're going to have to take worse jobs because you can't show up on time consistently and, and it's just this awful cycle the 30 percent credit card interest rates are not going to help no, I mean, and, and it comes back to just living within your means and just operating on principles. But it's at some point, it's like, you know, you get those unexpected life expenses and you just have to, people in really bad positions end up making a deal with the devil, which is, you know, the borrowers are slave to the lender. We, we talk about that all the time. Mm. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, ho- hopefully this won't affect too many people. I, I, I'm afraid it, it likely will in the aftermath of the hurricane. We need to discuss the Hurricane Milton and the economic fallout from that. It, it seems like the hurricane had less damage than some had feared, mm. but the damage is still pretty massive. There's an Ernst & Young report that shows real GDP growth is projected nationally to fall by 0.4% because of the Hurricane Milton. This is 0.4% lower in quarter four relative to where it otherwise would have been. Florida is expected to take an even bigger hit with the gross state product potentially declining three to four percent. Yeah, it's one of those deals where you can't overlook the the labor market too. I know they do those payroll surveys at this time. So anyone who had to evacuate or just all those Tampa Floridians who left, they don't get counted into the employment reports. So when the Fed looks at a lot of this, you know, data and they're data dependent, it's harder for them to make the case on the economy being strong. Even though we did get a good non-farm last Friday, um, this is going to show up in the long-term data. And then the fact that you just mentioned that this is going to impact national GDP by, you know, 0.4%. It's a, it's a I mean, huge that's, percent, that's, right? That's like, in the that's, billions. It's just, I mean, that's just massive. I think that's in the tens, at least tens of billions. That's a, it's a huge number. It reminds me of this concept, the broken window fallacy, which of course isn't news to, to many of our listeners. This is a common Keynesian progressive way of thinking. We can just spend more through these catastrophes and the economy will come back bigger, better, stronger, which of course is like breaking a window and saying, oh, now because we can buy a new window, we're better off. Well, here we have literal broken windows. Yeah, and the Paul Krugmans would say it's a good thing. Like, <laughs> he would say, yeah, like all, like you said, all the repair and that there's expenses, and they count all the FEMA money and all the the government emergency spending funds. That all ends up in GDP, by the way. So that's all, mm. and that's all debt expending. The model is so broken. Mm. There's an exciting junk silver offer coming on Tuesday, for the first time. silver dollars will be available at the same price as quarters and dimes. Watch for the email on Tuesday the 15th for the full details and the premium rates. And just to add to that, JD, you don't have to be on this email list. It's going to be updated site-wide on shiftgold.com. So on the homepage and by end of day, you'll see the junk silver rates come down. There's going to be a pretty significant discount on all junk silver, dimes, quarters, and halves. And as you mentioned, the half dollars, which are considerably more rare, uh, there was just less in circulation, they're going to be selling at that exact same rate per face dollar. Uh, I've never seen that before. So that's a shift gold first. And it's something that uh, is definitely, um, we, we don't do sales often, but that's definitely something to keep your eyes peeled out for. And other news to look out for? On Monday, Fed President Christopher Waller is speaking. On Tuesday, we have the Empire State Manufacturing Survey data coming out. And on Thursday, we have our regular Thursday jobs numbers coming out. And we'll close here with the quote of the week. This is a short but potent quote from theologian Martin Luther about high individual interest rates and the practice of usury. He said, whoever eats up, robs, and steals the nourishment of another, that man commits as great a sin as if he had strangled or starved such a person to death. Such is the sin of usury. Well, Joel, a pretty pretty dark (laughs) note to end on. Um, We still got a few more weeks till Halloween here, but which coincidentally is also Reformation Day, which Luther Luther is also a, a big fan of. So good quote here. That's funny. Thanks everyone for listening and we'll see you again next week.